I don't know exactly what your weeks look like, but if it's anything like mine, you might have experienced a few waves. Have you experienced, anyone experienced any waves this week? They've had to keep their eyes above, oh, lots of you, eyes above the waves? Yeah, that's been my week. But I'm in God's house and there's something special, isn't there, about coming together with his people and seeking his presence. As Phil said, his presence is always with us, but actually seeking that. And it's been a good time for me to worship, so I hope it has for you as well this morning. So if you've joined us the last few weeks, you'll know that this is our fourth week and it's actually our last week where we're having a look at Jesus' meal habits, if you like. Jesus liked to eat. I think Jesus liked to eat. I like to eat, so I kind of think if I'm made in the image of Jesus, then he liked to eat as well. So Jesus liked to eat and I'm sure he enjoyed um, conversation, enjoyed meeting with people around a table. But he took the opportunity every time, I think, at least as recorded in scripture, every time he sat around a table, he took the opportunity to actually teach. Sometimes using words and sometimes by just things that he did. And we've already seen over the last few weeks that a lot of the people that were around Jesus, a lot of the religious leaders, the Pharisees, took, um, took insult at some of the things he did and more particularly those people that he ate with sinners and tax collectors, the outcast, the unclean of society. These are the people that Jesus sat around a table with. He shared fellowship with. He accepted. He he considered them as one with him. Now, most of us, who's attended a wedding at all, ever? Everyone who's married has at least attended your own wedding. And many of you would have been involved in the organisation of a wedding. And there's so many like protocol things, aren't there, to do with a, a wedding. So many social norms and etiquettes and rules around the whole process of invitation, of the accepting of the invitation by a certain date, turning up on time if you say you're going to be there. And then when you attend a wedding, normally you're kind of seated according to your relationship with the bride and groom. Is that right? Or their family. So if you're the mother of the bride, you're going to expect to sit close-ish to the front, aren't you? You're not going to be put at the back. At least you've probably even had input into the table arrangements, so you know. But there's this general class, isn't there? Like, you know when you go whether you're like a close friend or family or whether you're probably going to be seated right up the back. Anyone understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, you do. And, and again, in the Middle Eastern culture, the culture where Jesus was, there was definite rules around etiquette, social norms, what to expect, the culturally expected thing to do would have been really well known. And any sort of meal, not just wedding feasts or banquets, any sort of meal reinforced forced a person's social standing. In other words, if, um, if you um, were a certain status, you would sit in a certain place at the table, and other status, you would sit at another place at the table, or you'd just watch from the out, outer courts. And the invite list was no surprise. People invited their social, religious, and economic peers, like-minded people, people they could expect to receive an invitation back from. And maybe you've even done that when you've planned a wedding or something before. You've thought, well, they didn't invite me to their wedding. Why should I invite them to mine? Or (laughs) some of you are grinning way too big there. But you know, like you're trying to get down the guest list and you think, well, there's certain people that I have to have and other people, well, really, they're not really that close to me. They're not really my equals. Now, Jesus, don't don't get Jesus wrong. Jesus knew the rules. Jesus was a smart guy. He knew the rules. He knew the social etiquette, the cultural norms. But as we all already know, Jesus wasn't about keeping rules or actually conforming to the cultural norms. And so here in Luke 14, we see Jesus still at the home of a Pharisee and he's correcting and challenging their behaviour. He's turning what they think upside down challenging them. And as the master teacher and storyteller, he's taught them some facts and then he goes on to illustrate it with a story, with a parable. And a parable is most often used by Jesus. Parables are just general things. They're like metaphors or stories. And he most often used them to describe what the kingdom of God was like. The kingdom of God's like this confusing thing in some ways. And so it's hard to sort of say in a few sentences what it is. So Jesus tells lots of stories about what the kingdom of God is like. And so he tells this story to these Pharisees who think they're going to be the only ones in the kingdom. They think they're the, you know, the bee's knees. They'd be the first, at least the most honoured guests, if not the only guests. And so here in chapter 14, Jesus is correcting their pious presumptions. 
And at first glance, when you read chapter 14, and if you haven't read the beginning of chapter 14, which we're not actually going to look at closely today, you should go home and read it because it's quite interesting. But at, at first glance, these events, or this chapter 14, seems to deal with mundane social issues, such as deportment at a banquet, seating protocols, and how to handle the embarrassment of putting on a banquet and having no one turn up. You could think of Jesus' teaching about that general stuff. But really, it's about something far more significant. It's about the citizenship of the kingdom of God. Who's going to be part of the kingdom of God? The Pharisees, these religious leaders, they'd long anticipated this feast at the end of the age where they would celebrate with joy the coming of the Messiah and their, their eternity in heaven. And obviously they had presumed attendance. And so our story kicks off in verse 15. And if you've got your Bible there, you should follow along today. In verse 15, it kicks off with one of these people saying to Jesus or saying to the table, blessed is everyone who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Eating bread was really just equivalent to sharing in this feast. Blessed is everyone. Now this guy assumed he would be there. We don't say blessed is everyone who is close to God and, and exclude ourselves. This guy is assuming, well, of course, I'm going to be there. And so that's why Jesus launches into this parable from verses 16 to 24. And I think he challenges this guy, the people around the table, and challenges us about this banquet, this kingdom of God and what it looks like. And I want us to consider three things today, three things that he challenged them about, but three things that, to me, are big challenges in my life. And maybe you need to ask yourself some of these questions today or consider these, this teaching of Jesus. And the first thing he's saying to them is, are you sure? Are you sure you'll be there in the kingdom of God? Are you sure you'll be there? In the previous chapter, in Luke chapter 13, 22 to 30, Jesus has already challenged their confidence of those assuming attendance at this banquet. They thought they were the chosen ones. And he warned them that many would try to enter but would not be able to. And Luke 13, 25, it says, when the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. And here in chapter 14, Jesus explains some of the reasons why people not, might not make it to this banquet when they assumed they would. And many of you would have heard this parable before. I've heard this parable many, many times since I was a young child. Did anyone sing a song about this maybe in Sunday school? I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. No? <laughs> and we may or may not have sung, I have married, I have bought me a wife, I have married a cow, you know, just because it seemed that little bit funny. You know, I feel thank Anyway, it was a song. Like, so I've, I've heard this parable over and over again, and I thought it was all about these excuses, but today I want to tell you, actually, the excuses are just one part. So anyway, let me tell you, at the day and age, it was customary for invitations to go out way before time, and people would have responded to those invitations. So these people that are making excuses, they've already said they're going to come. You know, so someone spent money putting on the banquet. You know, if you've held a wedding and you've put on, you know, a fancy meal, and then what would happen would be close to the time when the banquet was ready, the servant um, would go out and he'd collect everyone. He'd go, time to come, time to come, and they'd all be ready, and they'd just, they'd just come. And it's at this second, this second moment where these people are turning turning away the invitation or they're making excuses. It's actually very, very rude to do that. It's rude these days not to turn up to a wedding if you've said you're going to come, but in those days it was unheard of, totally unacceptable, not at all reasonable, and in fact, that's the shock horror of this parable. It was shocking for the readers to hear this sort of thing. I mean, the excuses. One must go and see a purchase field that he would definitely have seen before. No one bought property in the Middle East without knowing it like the back of his hand. They knew what the field was like. It was going to be there when they finished the, the, the feast. One had bought five pairs of oxen that they had to try out. Again, no one buys oxen without testing them. They would go down to the market, to the seller's field, they would watch them, they would make sure that they pulled the weight evenly and they'd negotiate a price. No one, you know, just turns up to try out oxen that they've already purchased. They've already tried it out, it's already done. And one has married a wife. Well, that was probably 
on the cards. It wasn't a surprise. And I'm not exactly sure, and neither are most um, scholars sure even, well, what would that mean? Like, why would marrying a wife prevent you from coming to, the, um, to, to a banquet? The truth is, really, we could analyse these excuses, and that's been done probably in many sermons I've heard before. But the reality is they're just unreasonable. They're not, they're not excuses. In fact, excuse... Well, they're not excuses as we would call them. Excuse, excausia in the Greek, which means free from charge. In other words, they know that they should be charged with some failure. They know they're doing the wrong thing. They know that this isn't actually a good excuse or a reason. But they're trying to, they're trying to um, win acquittal is really what the word means. They're trying to win acquittal. They're trying to make an argument to help them get out of, out of a charge. And so what happens? The master tells the messenger, go anywhere, go everywhere, compel them to come in. But those first invited, there'd be no place for them. You know, these excuses sound stupid, but how often do I find myself making similar excuses? How many times have those sort of excuses affected my relationship with God, prevented me from the best God has for me? Sometimes from coming to church, from being involved in a life group, from reaching someone with the good news of Jesus, from giving my best of my finances and my time. Sometimes those excuses get in the way of me spending daily time with God and growing in my relationship with him. And I would guess that most of us from time to time have used an excuse like this, perhaps regularly. Jesus says, it's not enough to be in receipt of an invitation. It's not enough to say, yep, I'll come. We need to be making sure that we're making choices in line with the kingdom of God. And so the second thing that this parable teaches us, I think, is that Jesus is the king of an upside-down kingdom. Jesus is the king of an upside-down kingdom. So as I said, parables teach us about the kingdom of God. And what this text really teaches us is that it's not enough to wear a label of being an invited one being a chosen one. But the kingdom of God must shape our whole identity with a different set of concerns. Our whole identity about how we live has to be different, is what Jesus is saying. So just preceding this parable, Jesus had taught the parable of the guests, and he challenged the Pharisees about their righteousness. He said, instead of inviting people close to you, inviting people in your family and social circles, social circles, You should invite people like the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. That's the list that Jesus gives. The poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. People with no means of repaying you. Jesus said you should invite people that don't normally get to experience a party. Often we invite people to things that we consider our equals, who can invite us back. But the kingdom of God, there's a total reversal of expectations. The kingdom of God turns things upside down. The kingdom of God is like a banquet where those who were supposed to attend were too preoccupied to come, and others not expected to to attend came and enjoyed the feast. The expected are absent, and the unexpected are present. That's what the kingdom of God is like, and that's a reoccurring theme in Jesus' teaching. And it's not always a comfortable message to hear. But isn't that what we see in Jesus' ministry? He tends to focus on comforting the disturbed, and disturbing the comfortable. And a response is necessary from us, just as it was from those original hearers. Are we modelling the kingdom of God? What are our values? Who do we care most about? Do our values um, mirror our culture, etiquette, social norms, worldly values? Or do they turn these social acceptable customs upside down? like the kingdom of God does. You know, we've considered over the last couple of weeks that all people belong at the table with Jesus. We've considered that like Jesus' examples to us, our focus should be on the heart, not on the rules and regulations and our outward appearances. And last week we were reminded that it's not possible to focus on Jesus if we're not focused on what Jesus is focused on. We can't say our eyes are fixed on Jesus and we're living for Jesus if our focus isn't what Jesus' focus is. And today I reckon Jesus is saying to us in this passage, a radically inclusive response 
radically inclusive response is the only appropriate response. Radical inclusivity. Some of you might know Major David Twivey. He's a great Salvation Army officer, and he's also a friend of mine. And uh, a month or so ago, last month, I saw him speak at the um, Salvo Academy that we've, we've been advertising about the Salvationist and alcohol. And I know his story, I know his story well, but he shared some of his story and it just took me um, once again about the power of invitation and the power of acceptance. And he shared how, um, as a young man, he got involved with alcohol and he ended up at the Salvation Army's Rehabilitation Centre in the city. And for six months, he attended Sydney Congress Hall, which is one of our churches in the middle of Sydney. And he attended there for six months. He sort of, sort of sat with a group of guys that went and not really connected, but, but listened and, and heard what was going on. And you know, there was a little bit of interest, but really didn't feel connected at all. And for six months, he really was an observer. And you know, after six months, one Sunday, one of the bandsmen came down off the platform. And he would say, and he did say, this is all live streamed, and I also got his permission to share today, but he would say the bandsmen were all lovely people. They'd all spoken to him, were very polite. But one day a bandsman came down and said, David, would you like to come and have lunch with us? And that conversation that pursued afterwards at the, the lunch table and many conversations afterwards around a meal led him to connect with Jesus, to become a Christian and in a very short amount of time, very short amount of time, to become an officer because he too wanted to use his influence and his example of Jesus to accept other people. And you know, I know of hundreds of people that have accepted Jesus from sitting down having a conversation with Major David Twivey. And he would say, it started with one man saying, come and have a meal with me. The power of invitation the power of acceptance, radically inclusive behaviour. I want to say today that when we talk about the kingdom of God being inclusive, it's not about not rejecting or not excluding. Inclusivity is not passive. It actually takes an effort to be inclusive, go out of our way, past the familiar and socially acceptable, to invite someone to be an equal with you, to be one, not just to accept that they are there or that they are here. We need to create room in our lives, room at our table for other people. When you have more than you need, the saying goes, when you have more than you need, don't build a higher fence, build a bigger table. I wonder if that's how we live our lives. So back to this parable, it illustrates it beautifully. The marginalised are not just invited, but the messenger goes out of his way. If you have a look at verses 21 to 23, we'll see this emphasis. It's Luke's emphasis. We've already said before, it's the Salvation Army's emphasis. It's really the church's emphasis that the poor and the dispossessed, the outcast, are able to participate in the joy of the kingdom of God. In fact, verse 21 basically says word for word what Jesus had said in verse 13 to them. You need to invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Jesus' kingdom of God, this new community, is a place where class, power, status, wealth, those, those differences are erased. The marginalised have their dignity restored. And if you look, as I said, in verse 21 to 23, we see the extent of this. And these words that are used... We talk about streets and alleys and the cities and, the, and the, the outer, I've got some words up there, the outer areas of the town. So you've got the platius, the, the primary streets, the town squares. That might be just the immediate area around us. And then you've got the streets and alleys that are leading off. The messenger goes further out of his way. And that's still not enough. He goes outside the walls of the city to the highways leading, the ones that led into and away from the city, and that still wasn't enough. He went to the lanes, along the hedge paths, the, the places where the derelicts of society sought refuge, and he brought even them in. None were left out. No effort was spared. Everyone was high on Jesus' agenda. The marginalised, the displaced. They were high on Jesus' agenda. They're supposed to be high on the Salvo agenda. I want us to ask ourselves today, are they high on our agenda? You know, because some will need to be convinced. You know that word, compelled, it took me when I was looking at this over the last couple of weeks, that compelled them to come in. That word in the Greek is anan 
kason and a kason, which means force. Force them to come in. Now, I don't actually think that Jesus wants you to, you know, hit someone with a Bible or literally, like, force them into the car and drive them to church, like, as in pull them by the arm. But it does imply that they're going to need some additional encouragement. A lot of people are going to be shocked to hear that they're welcome in the kingdom of God. They're welcome by Christians. So this isn't just a general invite. Oh, if you ever want to come to church, if you ever want to hear about my Jesus, if I can ever have a meal with you, but it's like, come have a meal with me. Come Friday night, not Friday night. What about Tuesday night? It's that persistent, compel, force, extra encouragement. You are welcome here. You are welcome in my life. I've been more and more challenged lately about who the marginalised are in our society. And I think there's obviously people who are marginalised, people that come in here every day hungry, the poor, the homeless. But, you know, I think that some of the most most marginalised in our society are probably those who are affected by mental illness, those who suffer the stigma the isolation, the unnecessary shame that comes along with mental illness. And, you know, right throughout history, as recorded in God's word, we see people who've journeyed with God through mental illness. People close to God's heart who struggled with depression, schizophrenia, bipolar. They were close to God's heart. They were God's people. God used them. You know, the stats say that in the world, one person dies every 40 seconds at their own hand. surprises me that society isn't better at talking about this and that churches haven't got this higher on the agenda. It surprises me that I don't speak about this more often. Jesus was so about removing barriers, restoring people who were suffering. You know, we need to be sure that our lives, our church, our families are about removing barriers and restoring people who are suffering. Do we know how to do that? No, not fully. But as we learn from Jesus, as we spend time from him, as we deeply desire to become more like him, his focus becomes our focus. And I know it's going to take more than saying we're a welcoming church. It's going to take physical and emotional effort, going out of our way and compelling people to accept God's gracious invitation. And it begins in our own homes, our extended families, those we know and love in our own lives. The parable, this parable emphasises, you know what, that the kingdom of God has begun in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is already accepting the marginalised, the lost, the poor, the crippled, the lame. His kingdom has come. This isn't just about who's going to be welcomed at the end of time. This is about who is welcomed in the kingdom of God now, today. Today. You know, the community of faith that Jesus has established should be and has to be a place where any distinctions of power and wealth and class and well or unwell or physically well or physically unwell, mentally well, mentally unwell, any sort of distinctions need to be removed. And Jesus wants dignity and worth restored for every single person. You know, Jesus was telling his listeners about the kind of hospitality we should offer. And you know how he knew it so well was because it was the kind of hospitality that God offers, offered and offers today. God who created a world for us to enjoy. God who made a covenant with his own creation when he didn't need anything from them, but he wanted to give. God who surrendered his own son to death on a cross to save that shame that we can experience and that many do. God gets hospitality, and he wants us to understand it too. We're going to sing a song in a moment. I firstly want us to, I'll invite you to close your eyes right now. And I want you to consider your own life. And I reckon there's probably people here today, I know there's people here today, and God wants you to understand that you don't need to be an outcast, that you're not an outcast in the kingdom of God, that you're not a misfit, that you're not outside. God wants to invite you in because he is working, always working on a way to restore dignity, to restore worth 
and you are included. No one is excluded unless an invitation is rejected. Secondly, I want you to consider for yourself, are you taking your attendance for granted, maybe? Perhaps you made a decision a long time ago. Maybe you're even a regular church attender. Maybe you think you believe the right things, but it's been a long time since you've thought about your choices and whether you are living out kingdom values, whether you're responding positively on a daily basis to that invitation. And thirdly, I want you to consider, who are you bringing with you? Who are you compelling, making an additional effort, going out of your way to invite to the banquet? Or to let them know more correctly about the invitation that is already theirs? I'm going to sing a song, and it's just a time to help us reflect, and if you don't want to sing, you don't need to sing, but I'm going to invite you to stand. And as you stand, I want you just to consider this morning your place in the kingdom. So would you like to stand? The place of prayer is open as it always is. And if you would like to come and kneel and to to pray for somebody that's on your heart, maybe you want to pray for someone who, who you know who needs their dignity restored, who you want to encourage about the kingdom of God and its values. Maybe you just want some guidance. You can come and you can pray for that. Maybe you need to pray for yourself today. Maybe you need to accept that invitation for the first time or for the hundredth time and say, God, help me to bear better live out your values here on earth. As we sing Jesus, I come, I invite you to come into his presence and to respond.